conceptual perspectives people talk Real about talk, it, it throwing shots. all of the elements. <laughs> Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody is having a, a good holiday season. Uh, for those of you who celebrate it, for those of you who don't, I hope that you are closing out your year strong. I hope that you are enjoying enjoying uh, family and much more. Uh, you know my saying, no matter how it's going right now, if you're still breathing, you're still in the fight. Trust me. Okay, so I touched on this when it initially happened. Uh, uh, a more recent update to the story has come out and I've been asked to uh, talk about that and I am going to share a link to the story so that you can see or read what I read uh, about it but about a month ago I guess um, the story broke I want to say in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, I, I believe that's where it happened. A 10 year old killed his mom over at the time what was being reported as her not buying him or getting him or giving him a virtual headset for his game. And a whole lot wasn't given at that. You know, I could tell about the digging that I did that the family had issues with him. The mom had trouble getting anybody in the family to watch him. We're talking about a 10 year old. Uh, what happened, uh, the basics of what happened is she told him no. She went downstairs in the basement to wash clothes. He went in her purse, got her keys where she kept the key to the gun safe. Do not well, don't keep the keys to your gun safe on your key ring. I mean, that's an obvious for anybody that wants to get into your gun safe. You need to keep it where you have access to it, but not where anybody else can that easily know it. Obviously, he had watched her. She's probably someone who carries her gun regularly, and so he's watched her going and out, so he knows it's on the key ring. Grab it, unlock it, and he got the gun. He went downstairs, and when she looked up, he had it. He raised the gun, and he pointed it at her. She asked him, based on his recollection, what are you, what, what are you doing? And he shot her, killed her on the spot, that's not the end of the story, though. He then went back upstairs, according to the reports and the things that I was able to dig up initially. We haven't even gotten to today's update. Um, went back upstairs, went in her purse again, got her wallet, got her credit card, and ordered the headset. Now, initially, he told 
law enforcement that he was playing with a gun twirling it like in western days and somehow he accidentally pulled the trigger I mean that's suspect in a lot of different ways but crazier things have happened right well when the auntie who is interviewed in this update along with the grandmother the, the mother so the mother of his mom and the sister of his mom are interviewed and um, beautiful mom of four children he's the youngest uh, but what when the aunt's on the way home taking him to grandma's house he tells her what really happens and she immediately uh, alerts her mother that the law enforcement needs to be there when they get there. So they take him into custody, take him to the juvenile detention center. Uh, he, the hearing has, his initial assessment has been done by the courts and while he is being detained in the juvenile detention center, he will be tried as an adult. Um, and I'm gonna touch on that in a minute. Um, Again, the mom, the grandmom, and the auntie. Their position is that the, the fact that he's been detained and not given a bond is probably best. The grandmother said that he's a wanderer. He tends to be up late at night when people are asleep, moving around. That makes me leery. That makes me weary. Uh, because we don't know what he'll do. He's proven he go, he'll go, you know, pretty much as extreme as you can be. And when asked if they thought before this that he was capable of going to that extreme, they said we knew he could do some bad things. We just didn't think it would be this bad. So with that being said, they also said they have absolutely no problem with him being charged as an adult. I personally believe that's coming from emotion. I, I believe that's coming from pain uh, and anger. I believe that's coming from the fact that, you know, this kid is seems like a, a problem kid because the reason that his mother was not getting it for him is because he was under treatment already for behavioral issues. So he was struggling with probably oppositional defiant disorder, um, maybe ADHD. Uh, but I mean, some of the things that I'm hearing about him doing, he may have also been sub been, been, been struggling with autism, uh, undiagnosed, but being that he was around so many uh, professionals, you think if he was, he would have been diagnosed and maybe he wasn't, they just didn't mention it. But um, there are definitely some behavioral issues outside the course or the parameters of what would be considered normal developmental issues with black males. Um, here's my, 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 my take on this because it's so much to be unpacked. We're not going to do it all in one one take because I want to really kind of look at evaluate see what's going on but uh, at this point in time he's being detained which I think he should be I think that he should be detained I think that uh, that's the best thing for him and others um, there's obviously something going on now the reason that this is what we're getting to the reason that his therapist made it a part of his treatment plan that his access to video games digital access to devices is because of the desensitization that goes along with playing violent games and that he had a proclivity that even when she would block it even then when she would say no he would find a way to access the stuff he wanted and he was drawn to violence and the most of the games from grand theft auto to call of duty to everything else is about killing and that's this desensitization number one is you die on this thing you can live again you come back and you play again and the idea of death has changed desensitized plus even the more you see death the less death bothers you and you lose the bearings of your norms and standards about life 
you tend to devalue life you tend to not see it as valuable you tend to not see violence as something uh offensive it's you start to see it as a normal part of human behavior and this is some of the things that he did with and I'm saying that as a digression and side note because we have our children being literally reared by technology. Our children spend more time with their devices than they do with us. We have gotten so caught up in the pools and the tears. That's something that Mary and I used to be very, very adamant about and we have did more than one video about screen time uh, and I'm not just talking about seven eight ten years old. I'm talking about teenagers as well you are allowing them to determine what stimuli is going to be the driving force and how they see the world how they view the world how they behave what sets their norms and standards now why is it important to determine what sets the norms and standards for your child why the, your norms and standards is what governs your conscious not your conscious mind your conscience not c-o-n-s-c-i-o-u-s but c-o-n-s-c-i-e-n-c-e -E. the thing that makes you feel bad when you do something you're not supposed to do the thing that makes you think do I really want to do this? That thing, your conscious, is, is governed by your norm and standards. That's why you can get one person who has absolutely no problem blowing someone's brains out and another person uh, can't even kill a bug. Norms and standards. People view death based on their experiences with death. Now, the problem with the human mind and the human brain is it has a problem distinguishing between what is real and what's being imagined, what's being viewed, and the stimuli is strong enough. That's why you can watch a movie, and even though the damn movie ain't real, you're crying. Why? Because the brain can't tell the difference. It strikes up emotions. It triggers memories. It makes connections. These, synapt these neurosynaptic connections that are made during this experience are triggering real emotions tying you to things and anchoring you to things that ultimately lead to your particular interpretation of life surrounding those things so again here's a kid exposed to it and they're trying to pull him off and he's so addicted to it that when he's told he can't have access to it it now becomes a trigger and it now becomes a trigger and you have all of these different things that you are all these different things that you are trying to confront and deal with with him while he is still acting off of the things that set the standard, the norms and the standard. What am I trying to say here? We've got an issue in our collective and it's not just with black children, but we start at home. We deal with ours. We work and we heal and we build for us. We can't fix the world. That's one of our biggest problems is we're always fighting others battles when we haven't dealt with what's in front of us and, I, and, and, and we have a problem. So that's the first thing that I want to touch on. The next thing I want to touch on is what he did was absolutely horrendous. Now, it could be. I don't think so. I haven't had a chance to get close to the kids, spend any time with the kids. So I'm just going off of what I've been able to read, what I've been able to hear. Um, but I don't believe that this kid is one of the 1% of people born psychopathic. Uh, I don't think he's a psychopath. I think that he is a socialized. Now he's a sociopath for sure. But, but that came a, a lot through socialization, not through birth, not genetic. He's not genetically predisposed. He's environmentally predisposed, and it has created a complete narcissistic, uh, sociopathic state of being in which only thing matters is what he wants. And he's proven that he's willing to go to any stretch. Now, here comes the thing that people are going to be extremely polarized about. Him being declared an adult for the sake of trial. Here's my problem. It isn't how long they hold him. It's the fact that when you try him as an adult, 
you judge him on adult standards. The whole law is set up around the predisposition of what you did. You knew what you were doing. Um, not just I knew I was taking a life. I knew it wasn't anything wrong with it. I knew that it wasn't justified. I knew I didn't have a right. And I knew what the consequences would be and so much more. We should all be aware and understand that at 10 years old, um, a child hasn't developed mentally at a level to understand everything and the consequences and ramifications. Uh, am I advocating for him to be free? No. He definitely needs to be detained. Um, and he may never be psychologically capable of being in the free world, but that should be a mental health issue, not a criminal one. Um, the reason I'm emphatic about this is this. George Steiny, 14 year old black man tried for something as an, tried as an adult for something he ended up not having done. Post sentenced to death at a, as a 14 year old and uh, 50 years later, 60 years later, something like that, posthumously exonerated. Does him no damn good. Um, that's in the system. Another 14 year old, not in the system, but in the public eye reality, seen as an adult by whites. White people see black boys as adult threats all the time. I mean, five year olds, I deal with this. You know how many parents I have to help whose children, whose boys specifically, have been referred for special, case, special education uh, assessments and assignments and given IEPs um, when it wasn't necessary because that's the easy thing to do. Their white middle-aged uh, female teachers don't want to spend the time to manage and work with them and help educate them because they don't understand them. They fear them, literally. Five years old, I'm telling you what I know, I deal with this. So the idea that we, it's as it's, it's, it's atrocious as an act, there, outside a parent killing a child, the worst thing that you can do is a child killing a parent. And so I'm not taking it lightly. I'm not suggesting that at any point in time, there's this point where he should just be released. Not, not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the idea that he can be tried as an adult, period, is a problem. It sets precedence and it's commonly done to us. Uh, what's the young lady that was, and it's another young lady right now, if, if her case hasn't been uh, uh, disposed of, but the young lady who's eventually got clemency from the governor uh, and released, I think she got married and everything, but she was literally convicted of murdering the person who kidnapped her and sex trafficked her. Um, it happened again to the other young lady who is still fighting. And this is a problem to me. This is common when it's us, not when it's them. Let me tell you what happens when it's them. Even at the age of 19 or 20, Brock Turner rapes an unconscious, uh, intoxicated young woman next to a dumpster Many people see it, walk up, catch him, hold him until the police gets there. And the judge says that sentencing him to what you would sentence somebody uh, for for rape would destroy his life. Gives him 90 days, he does 30, release him. From the last story I heard about a week ago, he's back in Ohio frequenting bars. And this is where it all started. And so this is the difference. Again, I'm not saying we don't hold ourselves accountable. We need a code of conduct, but we also need to understand with great certainty and clarity that, um, with great certainty and clarity that our children are our children. Uh, and some are going to have to be held and 
Some are going to have to be restrained and restricted. Um, some are recalcitrant. And that's an unfortunate reality. But I think that we have to be careful and look at the big picture. I can understand the anger of his parents, I mean, of his grandparents his grandmother and his aunt. I can understand that. You just took my daughter and my sister away from me. Uh, you just done the worst thing you could possibly do. And he did. He did the worst thing he could possibly do. He killed the one person who cared about him, who loved for him, who did everything she could to provide for him. He took her away behind a freaking video game. I get that. Uh, and I'm not advocating for him as much as I'm advocating for children who are going to do things that are absolutely unacceptable, but they're still children. And we got, we, we, to me, we are too ready to throw ours away, no matter what age. They do something, toss them. We the canceling and the tossing and the throwing away as people ever. And again, not everybody can be saved. Not everybody can be rescued. Not everybody can be healed and, 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 and uh, restored and all of that other stuff. Some people are just going to be dark. I get it. But I don't think we can determine at 10. We can take a wild guess for a kid to be able to do that at 10. We can take a wild guess that that's pretty dark and maybe he doesn't ever get back. But we don't know. I mean, that's a lot of darkness because even if you can get him out of himself, the first thing he's going to see when he comes out of himself is what he did. That's going to be hella destructive. So he's got to get out of himself and realize you killed your mom and you ain't ever escaping it. And you've got to learn to be okay and be productive in the world. Maybe he can, maybe he can't. But what we can't do is have 10 year olds being tried as adults. Now I get what's going on. I understand how the law is working. The law is saying he's 10. We can only hold him another 11 years if we try him as a juvenile. I think there needs to be an alternative. I think, okay, someone who you look at and say, 11 years, they're still not going to be, but they're a child. You don't try them as an adult. I think that you look at that and you declare that as some form of mental illness that now has him held and restrained and detained until he is determined by a council of professionals to be mentally stable. That may mean he spends the rest of his life detained. But what it doesn't mean is I'm going to try you as an adult at 10 so that I can keep you locked up for 40 years um, because I don't think you're going to be rehabilitated in 11. I get it, but I think that we've got to be careful with allowing a system to treat our kids as adults because it's not just going to maintain or be an issue within the system, within the, ju the judicial system. You're going to start seeing it and how they're treated. You already see it. They're killing our babies on the street behind bull crap. They're killing our babies if the babies run. They're shooting them in the back. They're shooting them uh, unprovoked, unarmed because they are treating them like adults and they are afraid of black men. We've got to be very, very careful here. Uh, with that said, that's what I'm going to uh, leave it on, on now, as for now. And on that note, I am out of here. Don't forget to support the work we do at the Odyssey Project. Look in the description box. Um, and let's make it happen. On that note, I'm out. Take care.
Thank you.